Hey, welcome to NASA Launchpad. I'm your host, Max Hennard. All right, so you know NASA's got big plans. They're heading back to the moon, they're looking at Mars, and a whole lot more. But you can't just flap your arms and fly into space. Nah, you gotta have gear first to get you up into space, then to actually do something out there. Let's face it, it's not about getting to space anymore. We've done that, all right? And most of us probably take it for granted. It's about what we can do out there and what we can learn. And some things that can be vital to the learning process are the tools and equipment we use. Enter technology. Okay, now let's take a step back for a second and think about how and why we build things. You got a problem, right? Or a question you want answered, well, you get an idea. You think it's gonna work a certain way, so you try it out. And maybe it doesn't work like you thought. So go to plan B. You think, hey, if I could get something that does this, that might do the trick. And so maybe that works or maybe it doesn't. And you keep trying different things, building different things, and eventually it works because it's something you build. And that's just what engineers do, okay? They build something to solve a problem or answer a question. Then they test what they build. And they may have to go back to the drawing board several times, but that's all part of the design process. So, how does this stuff get built? Well, yeah, you can build something by hand or you can have it mass produced with the help of machines. Now, NASA, in a lot of cases, doesn't use mass produced parts for its equipment. Sure, they get their pens and phones and computers like the rest of us by buying them from mass producers, but when it comes to what NASA does best, sending stuff into space, the vast majority of their gear is made of specifically designed pieces, from handmade thermal blankets to the shuttle tiles. It's all made special for space applications. No buying stuff off the shelf. But hey, guess what? There's only a limited amount of room when you're going to space, so you've got to make some tough calls on what gear you bring up with you, which in turn limits just what you can do when you're there. And that limits what you can learn, and you get the picture. And think about this, astronauts are gonna be staying in space longer than before, so the odds of a tool malfunction or needing a replacement are naturally gonna go up. What's an astronaut to do? It's not like you can go run into the garage and get another one. Well, how about we just make a new one? That's right, new tools in space, custom design. But I, I know it's on a teleprompter, but I, new, new tools in space? All right, for real? Okay, well, apparently this is legit, and it could be possible with the help of a little something called the Electron Beam Freeform Fabrication System, or EBF3. Yeah, I know, it sounds like something out of a bad sci-fi flick. What to do? Well, I guess it makes stuff. How? I'm not sure. So let's check in with an expert. Here's Karen Taminger, team lead on the project from NASA Langley Research Center. EBF3 is basically like Star Trek replicators. It allows you to build something that you didn't have before. So it works, we start with the drawing of a part and we feed wire in, we've got an electron beam that melts the wire and we build the part up as, as, as it's drawn. So you put the metal where you need it. So there you go, that's EBF3 in a nutshell. You design it, the machine builds it. And does that mean that little problem of food for long-term space flight is solved? Just tell the computer you want filet mignon and EBF3 whips it up for you? Well, my gut says that probably won't work. I'm thinking there's got to be some sort of limitation on this thing, right? Let's check the parents. Yes, there are limitations. It, it, is, it works primarily with metals um, because of the, the high power electron beam. All right, so you can't just make anything you want. I mean, that'd be pretty close to impossible, you know? I mean, you'd, you'd have to have a, a super a super duper machine and bring all the raw materials for anything you wanted to make because, you know, there's this little thing called the law of conservation of energy and matter. Energy and matter can't be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. Yeah, paid a little attention in science class. So, so how does that impact EBF3? How much matter do they need to make things and how much energy does EBF3 use? Karen, can you fill us in? EBF3 uses all of the wire that you feed in. So from the standpoint of taking something with you to, to space where it costs an awful lot of money to get there, uh, you wanna use everything that you bring. Uh, energy efficient wise, it's about 95% efficient, so 95% of, of the power that you pull from the wall actually ends up in the beam to, to heat or melt your material. All right, but we haven't even talked about taking the sky up into space. What kind of problems could that present? Karen? One of the challenges is trying to make something small enough to be able to put it, onto, put it into space and still have it usable for building parts of any size. And so that's one of the challenges that we've picked up, trying to uh, work with robotics and understand exactly how we can move around the part instead of trying to move the part around the system, the EBS3 system. 
The Vomit Comet was a blast. It was a whole lot of fun. Um, the equipment that we brought along with us was similar to what we've got here behind us. So we've got, we, we had a system that we flew and um, the equipment worked very well. And actually, the system, the EBF3 process works very similarly in zero-G as it does in one-G, which was not, an expect, not what we had expected. So why should you care? Well, EBF3 is not just good for space, it can be pretty helpful with some applications here on Earth too. Karen, show us what's up. Right now, the way we build airplanes is with straight stiffeners. It's efficient, but we believe we can make it more efficient. So we want to try to, to change to curved stiffeners. And what this can do, this will allow us to reduce the weight and also be able to control the, uh, the acoustics and, and you know, the noise. Be able to make the airplanes fly quieter, make them lighter, and make them cheaper to build. And that's just one use. How else do you think you could put EBF3 to use? I'll let you think about that, guys, because that's all the time we got on this episode. I'm Max Hennard. You stay classy, guys, and I'll catch you next time on NASA Launchpad.